Welcome to the video lecture for what I call chapter six, part one, which is basically the first part of chapter six. And in this part, we're going to start looking in more detail at the actual structure of atoms, specifically the electrons that quote unquote circle around the outside. This is by far one of the more interesting, in my opinion, chapters of the whole Chem 221 through Chem 223 sequence. Uh, this whole chapter really probably was not where chem thought chemistry would go. Uh, lots of new kind of developments that happened along the way. Uh, when it comes right down to it, basically everything in this section comes from the equation which is at the top right here. H nu equals E nu. Um, <clears throat> H is called a type of a function and it works on a wave function which is this thing right here. And when you do this kind of math procedure, you get the same function back. You can see that's the same math function, but most importantly you get the energy. And knowing the energy of electrons is super important to chemists. If you're curious about what that psi symbol is, the H psi equals E psi thing, um, down here in the lower right I have some examples of what those psi's look like. We're going to look at some stuff that comes from some pretty sophisticated math, but before we go into that I want you all to know that at Mount Hood Community College, if you take up to Math 254, multivariable calculus, you can absolutely do all of the problems uh, we're going to talk about, at least in a general sense, in this chapter. The math is kind of crazy, but it is stuff you can do after taking Math 254. So it's not like stuff that's impossible to you by any means, and I don't want you to feel left out by any means when things like that start happening. Um, one of the main players that developed H psi equals E psi and these other things, his picture is here in the upper right hand corner. His name is Schrodinger and Schrodinger is a real fascinating person both from a scientist perspective and from a personal perspective. His philosophy is quite uh, interesting. I find him very entertaining if nothing else to read about and I do encourage you as a side project to check him out in more detail. But more importantly, this uh, area we're going to get into, which is collectively known as quantum mechanics or quantum chemistry, stuff like that, affects people in very strange ways. And if you look at the background picture here behind the H psi, E psi, and all the notes I have for the thing, um, this is actually the picture of a woman's stomach. And I found this picture online. I was like, Wah. anyway, and someone wrote, on this person's stomach uh, all these different equations. Those are wave function equations and stuff like that that you'll start to see. People get really weird when it comes to quantum mechanics and it makes it for a very interesting section to talk about. But anyway, um, so I'm giving you lots of weird things here. This is probably not what you expected to see in a chemistry lecture and I completely understand. Uh, however, it is a very entertaining chapter and this chapter uh, truly brought chemistry in into the modern era and we're still dealing with the ramifications of all this stuff in our day-to-day -day world. So without further ado, let's check out chapter 6 part 1 where we investigate quantum mechanics and the structure of atoms. Atomic structure is very important and we've already talked about how things like Rutherford's gold foil experiment was able to tell that the nucleus was very dense and the protons and the neutrons were in the nucleus and the electrons kind of circled around the outside. The circling around the outside part is what we're going to focus on big time in this section and a lot of the information that was gathered about how electrons are distributed comes from the study of light. And you can see in the fireworks animation there and also those little flames on the left, you can have different colors depending on the types of elements inside them. Fireworks are actually an expression of this. Like you can have certain colors that are green. I believe strontium creates kind of a red color. Sodium is kind of a yellow color. Um, if you have pure elements, they all have different colors. And you might be thinking, huh, well, wonder where 
these colors come from? Well, this is what other people thought in previous decades and centuries. And then they basically slowly started figuring out what's happening. And along the way, then they also figured out more about how electrons are placed around atoms. So in this section, we're going to start talking about color. And you can't start talk, col talking about color unless you talk about light. Let's see what's happening here. Visible light is a form of electromagnetic radiation, which emanates from the source as waves. The waves are electric and magnetic fields oriented perpendicular to each other. Electromagnetic radiation, or EM radiation, as it's sometimes abbreviated, is the um, a type of energy, and it's an energy that has uh, both an electric component and a magnetic component. So you can see the red little dots right there and the kind of gray pieces. They're essentially at 90 degrees from each other. One of those is an electric field, and the other one is a magnetic field. But the important part for us now is that the light that you're using right Right now to see this animation and whether the light comes from your computer or from an overhead light or the sun all of that is a type of electromagnetic radiation and to understand the concepts in this particular section we really need to explore more about what light is so this guy named Maxwell, who also has a cool beard and stuff like that, um, as well as James Jewell from the last chapter, he was the one that really developed a lot of the theory behind electromagnetic radiation. And it's interesting because in some level, a lot of the particles like electrons will behave like waves. So we're going to use the knowledge of waves to understand more about electrons, particles. And this is something else we're going to get into. So in order to talk about how electrons were done, we need to talk about light. And in order to talk about light and electrons, we need to talk more about waves. So waves actually have some here are some properties that are important for what we're going to be talking about. Waves have a wavelength, which is the distance from where the wave starts to where it stops. And this wavelength, which gets the symbol lambda right there, is truly a length. It can be measured in meters or centimeters or micrometers or nanometers, stuff like that. And I'll show you a picture in the next one. Frequency represents how many waves travel by a certain point per second. Usually it's per second. Frequency gets the symbol mu, and that looks like kind of like an italicized V, and that's fine, but frequency is literally the number of waves that go by per second, per unit time. There's also node and amplitude, which we'll talk about a little bit, but the wavelength and frequency of a wave is going to be really important to us. So let's look at a diagram which shows better what wavelengths and frequencies are all about. Here's an example of two waves. One of them is from visible light and the other one is from ultraviolet light. And both visible light and ultraviolet light or ultraviolet radiation are examples of this electromagnetic phenomena that we're going to start talking about. Now, one of the things I mentioned was a wavelength, and wavelength is literally a distance, and you can measure it in meters, nanometers, kilometers, whatever. It's between, it's the distances from where the wave starts to where the wave stops. Now, because waves constantly go on and on and on, you can also say from where it starts to where it starts up again, and that's fine, but hopefully you get the idea. These waves go up and down, and before it goes, starts going up again, that's going to be the wavelength. Notice that in the ultraviolet under here, we also have a different wavelength. It's also from where the wave quote unquote stops and where it starts. Notice that in the visible light, it starts to go up and then down before we stop it. In the ultraviolet, we start at where it starts to go down and then up. Same thing. It's where the wave starts and stops. It's one complete wave cycle. All right, no problem. Now, the middle line, right through the middle right here, is like a zero point. And you can consider the wave to have no basis there. There's, it doesn't exist for a little bit. And up, first it goes above the wave, and then it goes below. But the points where it actually touches that line, those are called nodes. And nodes will be important. Now, a node is a natural phenomena of a wave. All right, it's a place where the wave 
doesn't look like it exists. All right, it does, but it doesn't exist at that particular point. And uh, that'll be important to us later on. Amplitude, we won't talk about too much, but amplitude is essentially the distance from that zero point position to the top of the wave. And in a lot of waves, the distance from the zero to the top will be the same as the distance from zero to the bottom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, what I would like to talk about, though, is what's called frequency. Frequency is literally how many waves go by per unit time. So if you look in the green right here, I have a time equals zero and and a time equals t. And I have the same thing below for the ultraviolet. There's time equals zero and time equals t. So notice for the visible light, we go through one wave here and about half of a wave to get to time t. So the frequency would literally be 1.5, one and a half waves per unit time. And if that time t was a second, that would be 1.5 waves per second. Now, the ultraviolet, on the other hand, has one wave here, it has two waves there, and it even has three waves. So the frequency of this wave is 3.0 waves per unit time, or if time is seconds, 3.0 waves per second. And that's an interesting thing. So notice that one thing that distinguishes visible light, which is what we see, versus ultraviolet light, which gives us sunburn if we stay on the sun too long, one thing that's different is that definitely they have different frequencies. Ultraviolet has a higher frequency, more waves per unit time than visible light does. But also, if you look at the wavelengths, and assuming this is a comparable scale, visible light has a longer wavelength and ultraviolet has a shorter wavelength. So this leads into this part down here, which we're going to talk about more later. As the wavelength gets bigger, the frequency gets smaller. So wavelength of visible light is longer, but the frequency number is smaller. And on the other hand, ultraviolet has a smaller wavelength, all right, but it has a larger frequency. So as wavelength goes up, frequency goes down, or as wavelength goes down, frequency goes up. And those things will be helpful to us later on. There are different kinds of waves. There are what they call moving waves. Like those are the waves like at the ocean. If the waves come in from outside, they splash and they go back. Those are moving waves. Most of what we're going to talk about here in chemistry is what's called a standing wave. So imagine that you um, have a rope and it's connected to the wall and you decide to start rotating it. And at first you rotate it just a little bit. So it just goes up and down a little bit. But then you start moving it more and more. So you actually have more more vibration and then you really start yanking on it and you have even more. Those are all standing waves. The wave is not moving. However, you do have, for example, the wavelength. All right. So this would be one wavelength right there. You have so many waves going by per unit time. You have nodes and stuff like that. Everything we're going to look at in chemistry is basically a standing waves. We're going to see that there's ways to relate the electrons to to these standing waves, which is kind of interesting. So waves have a frequency, and frequency usually gets the symbol nu. It looks like a little V and stuff, and you can write it as V as far as I'm signed. That's, that's okay. Now, frequency is technically the waves that go by per unit time, but almost everyone uses cycles per second or waves per second, which is what that means. So anyway, uh, all radiation, and this is kind of cool, but all radiation has a relationship. Remember how we saw how as wavelength goes up, frequency goes down, and as frequency goes up, wavelength goes down? Well, that's because if you're in like a vacuum, wavelength times frequency equals C. And C is called the speed of light. Speed of light is going to be something we're going to use from here all the way in through Chem 223, 2.998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And if the speed of light is a constant, then you can maybe see that if wavelength goes up, the speed, the wave, the frequency has to go down. And if the frequency goes up, then the wavelength has to go down. Those two multiplied by each other have to always equal the speed of light. 
So longer wavelengths, smaller frequencies, smaller wavelengths, higher frequencies. This is why it is. They're all related by the speed of light. I would highly recommend that you memorize slash put in your calculator slash make a tattoo. Don't make a tattoo. That would be too silly even for me. But anyway, somehow make sure that you know the speed of light. We're going to use that for a lot of things coming up. 2.998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Visible light, then, the light that we use to see in our eyes is actually a range of wavelengths. And I want you to pay attention to this little part right here. Um, notice here how on the right hand side we have a bunch of nanometers. Now remember nano is one of the metric prefixes. Nano is 10 to the minus 9. There are 10 to the minus 9 meters per nanometer. So it's a very small unit of measurement. However, the difference between like red light and blue light has to do with the wavelength. Red light is closer to 700 nanometers. On the other hand, blue lights are closer to 400 nanometers. So it's kind of cool. You can see the difference. So if you look around you right now, you're seeing different wavelengths and stuff coming into your eyes. Our eyes are really good at um, observing, if you will, changes in this particular wavelength region, which is pretty cool. Now, if you look at those wavelength numbers, 400 at the top, 700 at the bottom, they're getting, the wavelengths are getting bigger as you go down in this particular version, 400 to 700. On the other hand, if wavelength is getting bigger as you go down, all right, uh, then frequency would be getting smaller as you go down, or frequency would be getting larger as you go up because the wavelengths are getting smaller. So remember, they're opposite each other, opposite. Um, this little picture, this little animation right here uh, is showing the changes to the different colors, all right? And right now we're kind of in the yellow 600 nanometers, and we're going to start getting to orange, and then eventually we're going to get to red. And notice how those wavelengths, the distance from top to top, it's getting larger because 700 nanometers, one of the larger ones, is the red. It's going to revert back to blue. Here we go, blue or purple, whatever, small getting larger, larger, larger. So you can see how as the color changes, the wavelength is changing too. The wavelengths are getting bigger as you go from blue to red. And that also means that, of course, that the number of waves going by uh, would be alternate. Now, some scientists use Roy G. Biv to recognize the order of the colors. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And that can be helpful for us, too. Um, we're going to see that there's a relationship between the wavelength of something and the energy. So knowing Roy G. Biv is a way to also talk about about the energy of things. Um, the wavelengths are getting bigger as you go left on this Roy G. Biv. On the other hand, the frequencies are getting bigger as you go right on that list. So Roy G. Biv can be helpful when it comes to colors and as we'll see energy and stuff like that. Here's an example of kind of the things you can do. Let's say that you have a red light with a wavelength of 700 nanometers. Now remember that dot means that the zeros are significant, so that's a three sig fig number. Let's calculate the frequency of the red light. No problem. So if you remember from before, frequency times wavelength equals speed of light. So we're going to use the speed of light. The speed of light, though, is in meters per second. So let's convert the nanometers over to meters. And this is a good chance to reacquaint ourselves with the nano. Nano is 10 to the minus 9. So a nanometer would be 10 to the minus 9 meters. So 700 nanometers times 10 to the minus 9th. 7.00 times 10 to the minus seventh meters. Make sure you can do this on your calculator. Make sure you've got the powers of 10, the exponent EE button, good to go. If you aren't getting these numbers, you let me know right away, but try them. Make sure you can do them before going on because it'll mess you up from here on in. Anyway, once you have the wavelength in meters, that's when you can pull the speed of light in. Speed of light C divided by wavelength lambda equals the frequency. So the next part we're going to do is we're going to take that 2.998 times 10 to the 8th number, that's the speed of light, and divide it by the frequency, 7.00 times 10 to the minus 7th meters, the number we just calculated. You want to have meters over meters, so they cancel out. 
And the units then for frequency, you can see, uh, are going to be 1 over seconds or inverse seconds. And the number comes out to be 4.28 times 10 to the 14th inverse seconds. Now let's talk about what that means. <clears throat> frequency is number of waves going by per unit time. And like I said, most of the time people will use seconds. So that's saying that for this light at 700 nanometers, every second you have 4.28 times 10 to the 14th waves going by. And that's quite a lot, <laughs> all right? Uh, that's a lot of waves. That's a heck of a lot of waves. But anyway, this is how you can calculate it. The units of frequency, you'll see seconds minus one. Sometimes you'll see just S minus one. And sometimes you'll see one over S and they're all fine. Another way that set that the frequency is represented is through what's called a Hertz. Hertz gets the symbol HZ because who wants to write S to the minus one or one over S for that matter? So 4.28 times 10 to the 14th Hertz means 4.28 times 10 to the 14th inverse seconds. If you look on your car radio, if you have one or if you have a radio, a lot of times FM radio stations will be megahertz and AM radio stations will be kilohertz. Those are frequencies. All right. All all the FM and AM dials are all different types of frequencies. So you can see all kinds of relationships to the things around you. Couldn't resist. This is Hertz himself. And the joke is calculating frequency. It's so easy. It hurts. <laughs> okay. Silly sense of humor. I know. Anyway. The electromagnetic radiation spectrum, all right, which is what visible light's all part of, is actually much bigger than just visible light. So I mentioned radio, all right, AM, FM radio, all right. Radio waves are also part of the EM spectrum. So this little diagram right here shows the different portions of the known EM spectrum. Radio waves are way down here on the right. And just up from that, you have microwaves. So in the microwave, heating up your popcorn or whatever. Uh, that's the microwave kind of microwaves. <clears throat> infrared is after that. Infrared is often associated with heat. All right. Infrared is like hot. Then in a very narrow region right here in the middle, you have the visible light. And here's a uh, blue light on the left and red light on the right, kind of like we talked about. But then going on, ultraviolet radiation is the type that gives you sunburn and stuff, or uh, it's pretty powerful. X-rays are the next one. Of course, X-rays, if you've broken a bone or something like that, they can do an X-ray on you. And finally, the thing that created the Fantastic Four, no, I'm just joking, gamma rays are actually the highest energy of all. And gamma rays come from super high nuclear reactions. Uh, sometimes they can come from space, from uh, astronomy kind of interactions going on. But the important thing here is that radio, microwave, infrared, visible, ultraviolet X-rays, and gamma rays, they're all EM the radiation, all right? They all have wavelengths, and that's what these numbers are right here, and they have frequencies, which are these numbers right down there. <clears throat> Notice how um, the frequency goes from a very, very small 10 to the minus, or wavelength, excuse me, goes from a very, very small 10 to the minus 12 here for gamma rays to almost one meter when it comes down here to radio waves. So wavelength is getting bigger as you go left to right. Notice how the frequencies down here get smaller as you go left to right. You've got 10 to the 20th there for gamma rays, and it goes down to 10 to the 8th or so. So pretty cool and stuff how this stuff all works out. But there is a relationship then between microwaves and visible light, or x-rays and microwaves. They all have wavelengths, they all have frequencies, and the speed of light is how you can tell one from the other. Speed of light equals wavelength times frequency. Sometimes people use this acronym to uh, remember the diagram order. Rabbits mate in very unusual, expensive gardens, which of course makes no sense, I understand. But anyway, rabbit radio, mate microwave, in infrared, visible, very, of course. Unusual stands for ultraviolet, expensive is x-rays, and gardens gamma rays. And again, just like we've seen uh, before, there's gonna be a relationship between these 
abilities and energy, so it's a good thing to know. Um, notice the blue arrow right there. It says increasing frequency, increasing danger. We're going to see why that's the case here in a little bit, but it's pretty true. Like ultraviolet will give you a sunburn if you're out in the sun too long. X-rays, you know, people will always put those lead aprons on at the um, dentist if you do them. And gamma rays, you really just don't want to be around at all if you can help it. So <clears throat> anyway, there's a reason for it, and we're going to look at that here uh, coming up pretty soon. Which of the following produces radiation having the highest frequency? Now, highest frequency and uh, would be the lowest wavelength, but that's not what we're worried about here. Now, using this chart up here, this is pretty easy. Uh, we just talked about how increasing frequency means increasing danger. So the right side would be the highest frequency and the left side would be the lowest of them. So we have here microwave. We have here FM radio and radio is radio, okay? Radar is a type of a radio wave as well. Radar stands for uh, radio detection and recognition, if I remember the acronym right, but it is a type of radio. And then finally, there's cosmic rays. Well, cosmic rays are actually particles kicked out by the sun uh, when the sun is reacting, so that's not a type of electromagnetic radiation. Um, and since FM radio and radar are basically radio waves, we would say that microwaves have the uh, highest frequency. It's just to the right of radio waves, highest frequency, and the other two would be smaller frequency, and cosmic rays doesn't count. Darn it. So this leads us into something which I think is really, really important to talk about, and it's called The Clouds Speech by Lord Kelvin. Now, Lord Kelvin, which is the name that uh, the Kelvin temperature scale was given to, was a powerhouse in science. And he did a lot of work with thermodynamics and stuff like that, which was really cool. But Lord Kelvin uh, got kind of arrogant. And in 1900, he gave a public speech, and you can look this up if you want, and he stated that current thermodynamic understanding basically has everything figured out, <laughs> all right? There's a couple of these clouds which they hadn't figured out yet, but pretty soon even those were going to be worked out, and he essentially was discouraging people from going into physics, and in theory, all physical sciences like science. They Truly, and it wasn't just Lord Kelvin, it was kind of the mentality at the time. They really thought that they had basically figured out everything in science. Okay. The clouds that they hadn't figured out, there were two main ones. There was something called the failure of the Michelson-Morley experiment. And that's not for this class to talk about, but it's really cool. And the important part here is that this failure, quote unquote, led to special relativity, which is one of Einstein's thing. And this is a really cool area to talk about, but it's definitely more of a physics thing than a chemistry. So just realize that this cloud that he didn't, Lord Kelvin didn't understand, led to something pretty cool. But even more important is that Lord Kelvin said, well, another cloud is the failure to understand black body radiation. And he says, but you know, we'll understand it pretty soon. Well, no, <laughs> that didn't really happen. Black body radiation, the study of it, led to what's called quantum theory. Quantum theory is quantum mechanics, quantum chemistry, all this kind of stuff. So I look back on this, and you should too, at the arrogance of this scientist, Lord Kelvin. And he was a powerhouse. I mean, we still use the the Kelvin temperatures all the time. We look back on this and you have to laugh a little bit. All right. He was definitely arrogant and was trying to figure it out. Let's talk about the ultraviolet catastrophe. The ultraviolet catastrophe is a really interesting thing. If you take a metal, all right, and you heat it up to really high temperatures, the color will change. Like first you get kind of a red color, then you get kind of a blue color, and you can even get white light. If you've ever heard the expression white hot, that's where it comes from, all right? So the energy of light does have a, a relative dependence uh, on the type of temperature. And in the lower right-hand corner there, uh, you can see the red light curve at the bottom, the kind of green light, 4,000 Kelvin, the blue-white light, 5,000 Kelvin, etc., etc. 
According to classic physics, classical physics, all right, they thought that you could just keep on uh, maxing out the temperature. So you could go from 3,000 to 4,000 to 5,000 to 6,000, et cetera, et cetera. And you'd keep on having more and more different kinds of things. But that's not what you saw. Um, classical physics just thought it would keep increasing. But really what happened is that at very high temperatures, there is a maximum, a maximum intensity, and it's in the ultraviolet region, just a little bit to the left of the visible right there, but it does reach a maximum, and then it starts to go down. And this didn't make sense to classical physics. Like they thought, excuse me, you just keep adding temperature, 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 and it goes up, but that's not what they saw. They saw that it goes up for a little bit, but then it begins to decrease. Why don't you see like ultraviolet lines and stuff in just as much category? So this is called the ultraviolet catastrophe, and it has to do with how metals, and especially metals, behave under super hot conditions. And they thought that the temperature, the intensity would just go up, 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 and in reality, it went up and then down. A metal bar, like all objects at room temperature, emits infrared radiation. When heated to a relatively low temperature, however, the emitted radiation is in the red portion of the visible spectrum. As temperature increases, more light of shorter wavelengths is emitted until the bar glows white hot. In general, the hotter an object, the shorter the wavelength of light it emits. As the bar cools down, its glow returns to red. So you can see in the animation there how as they heated it up, first it was kind of a red color, and then it got kind of a white color, like all different colors all together. And again, they thought that it would just keep going up and up and up, and you'd have lots and lots of ultraviolet and stuff, but you don't. There's like a maximum amount possible, and they called this the uh, ultraviolet catastrophe. Along came a guy named Max Planck, and Max Planck proposed that an object can gain or lose energy by absorbing or emitting radiation in quanta, all right? And quanta was kind of an interesting idea, um, and no one had thought about this before. He proposed that the energy of the radiation is proportional to the frequency, all right? So we said that energy equals h nu. And this constant h was a brand new thing. And they figured out what h was. h is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. h is now called Planck's constant because Planck was the one that kind of brought this out. Planck is a powerhouse. One of the large universities in Germany is the Max Planck Institute, and they do some really high-level kind of stuff there. Um, Planck was really cool in figuring out that, yes, you can understand the ultraviolet catastrophe if you have this E equals H nu. And there's a lot more detail to this uh, than we're going to talk about here, but do realize. Um, in the lower left corner, this is the Rowley genes law, and it was basically the one by classical physics that just said it's going to increase, 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 increase until you never know. When you actually used Planck's constant and the ideas behind it, boy, the fit was perfect. All right, and there's a lot more to this, and we're just kind of glossing over it right now. But because the line and those dots are the same, that shows that Planck's function was a lot more effective at describing this ultraviolet catastrophe than the classical physics was. So knowing about Planck's constant is important, but they really had no idea how important Planck's constant is, and that's what we're going to see. Now again, the idea here is that the radiation that comes out of something, it's going to be quantized. There's going to be small little pieces associated with it, and each of those pieces has a frequency nu, and you can relate that back to the energy E by Planck's constant. So that's what we're going to focus on. We're not going to talk about the ultraviolet catastrophe as much as we are about how we can use this E equals A new. E equals H nu. All right, and H is Planck's constant. V there is the nu, that's the frequency. And remembering that nu frequency equals speed of light over lambda, you can also write this as energy equals Hc over lambda, where again, this is the wavelength, nu is the frequency, and they're both related to energy. Now, I'd like you to see that frequency nu and energy are directly 
directly proportional to each other. So as the frequency nu goes up, the energy is going to go up as well. On the other hand, the wavelength is in the denominator for energy. So as the wavelengths get bigger, the energy is actually going to decrease. And as the wavelengths get smaller, the energy will get larger as well. So notice here, here's kind of an overview. Light with large wavelengths will have small frequencies. They're inversely proportional. And large wavelengths will have small energies. Small frequencies will also have small energies. On the other hand, light with a short wavelength will have a large frequency. Again, they're inversely related to each other. And if you're going to have a small wavelength, you're going to have a large energy. We'll use these discussions here coming up. And you might look back on the types of uh, frequencies which were dangerous in that light slide. You'll see that they're the larger frequencies. Larger frequencies mean larger energies. Got to be careful of those larger energy systems. Which of the following wavelengths represents the highest energy? Okay, so the first one is 47.1 meters. The second one is 47.1 nanometers. The third one, 47.1 hertz. Now, let's talk about wavelengths again. Remember, wavelength is a distance. And hertz, hz, that's actually a type of a frequency. All right, so c is not a wavelength at all. That's a frequency. That's bad. But so c is flat out. All right, C is a frequency, not a wavelength. On the other hand, A and B are both wavelengths. 47.1 meters is a lot bigger than 47.1 nanometers. So if you go back to the kind of gold thing right there, as wavelength gets smaller, then the frequency will get bigger. And as wavelength gets smaller, the energy will get bigger. So the biggest, highest energy is going to have the smallest wavelength. And in this case, the smallest wavelength is certainly the 47.1 nanometers. So in this case, small wavelength, large energy. 47.1 nanometers should have a bigger um, energy than the 47.1 meters. Good. After Planck, there was a lot of questions as to where Planck's constant came from, and nobody honestly had a very good idea at the time. But along the way, uh, Albert Einstein, who probably you've heard of before, a really great scientist, um, started getting into the picture. Now, Einstein is, is really well known for a lot of different theories, and he's a really cool, interesting person to read about as a person. However, the th only thing only thing. The thing that he got the Nobel Prize for, all right, is something called the photoelectric effect. And that's not as famous as like the general relativity and special relativity that he's well known for. But photoelectric effect is pretty cool. So I'd like to talk about photoelectric effect here because it does help us to understand what's happening in the atom. And photoelectric effect was something that was observed. Um, light emitted on a piece of metal can actually kick electrons off the metal. And I want you to just think about that because light, you know, if you beamed a flashlight at me, I'd be like, ha, ah. but I mean, it wouldn't do any damage. I wouldn't like go flying backwards or something like that. Light is, seems pretty innocuous, but somehow when the light gets on the metal, electrons are emitted and they have different ways and stuff. I'll show you a video here to kind of detect it. If you stop the light, then the electrons start kicking out. So it's definitely the light that's making this happen. When yellow light shines on the metal surface, electrons are knocked out of the metal. As long as light of sufficient frequency shines on the metal, free electrons are produced and a current flows through the tube, as measured by an ammeter. The current stops flowing when the light is turned off. The photoelectric effect is pretty interesting because it shows how light almost is acting like a particle. Like if you threw um, a particle at me, it would bounce off my head, but there would be interaction, mass and mass. It kind of makes sense. Momentum, if you're into physics, all right? But light doesn't have any mass, but somehow the light is able to make matter move, all right? The electrons, which are little pieces like a ball bearing or whatever, are able to move by that. So this is a really cool cool kind of thing. And apparently um, metal detectors and stuff like that use the photoelectric effect uh, when they detect metals going through things like that.
Photoelectric effect helps to explain the particle nature of light. Now, I hope you're sitting down at this point because this gets a little weird, but light, all right, which is all around you right now, I would imagine, at least coming from the video, light actually has particle behavior. And that's weird. Now, a particle, like if you throw a particle at another particle, they bounce off, all right, momentum and stuff. But light uh, doesn't do that, all right? But sometimes light behaves like a particle. And that's what the photoelectric effect is. Somehow it's like knocking into those electrons, dislodging them from the metal, so they go flying out the opposite side. Classical physics said that the electrons, the energy, excuse me, of the ejected electrons should increase as the light intensity increases. And that kind of makes sense. So if the electrons are getting kicked off, you then have more intense light. You'd think you'd have higher energy electrons, but you don't see that. There's like a threshold value that you need to attain, and then it's basically a constant. So there's no electrons observed until you get to a light of a certain minimum energy. And as we saw, energy is proportional to frequency frequency, so it could be a minimum frequency. And again, this was pretty wild kind of stuff. It still feels wild to talk about it even today. Light is said to, explain, to display a wave-particle duality. Let's talk about what that means. Wave-particle duality means that light, which is electromagnetic radiation, wavelength, frequency, all that kind of stuff, behaves often like waves, but sometimes like particles, all right? So it will behave, light will behave like a wave in diffraction, interference, if you know about these kind of things, but it can also behave like a particle in the photo electric effect and this was like whoa man this totally blew scientists mind because light is light right you know you aim a flashlight and stuff like that or heat or blah 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 but it doesn't behave like a particle and we're gonna see it's not just light that has wave particle duality there are other things that have wave particle duality and again that just means that sometimes it acts like a wave sometimes it acts like a particle and that's so trippy. But Einstein was the first one to crack that egg open. And oh my gosh, here we go. Experimental observations can be understood if you break light down into discrete particles. Quanta is what uh, Planck called them. Let's call them photons. And the photons have discrete energy. So quanta is basically an early name for what we're going to start calling a photon. So let's say that we wanted to calculate the energy of one mole of photons of red light. And let's say that the red light has a wavelength of 700 nanometers, all right? And earlier, when we did 700 nanometers, we found that the frequency was 4.28 times 10 to the 14th inverse seconds, or hertz. We're going to use that number here in a little bit then to calculate the energy. So this is kind of cool. Energy equals H times nu, according to Planck's constant, or Hc divided by lambda. Just remember that you want to make sure your wavelength is in meters. Right now, of course, it's in nanometers. So let's use the frequency just because the units are set up. Now, Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules seconds, joules times seconds, which is weird, but those are the units, and it makes things work out. It is joule times seconds because frequency frequency is 1 over seconds, or seconds minus 1. So the second on the top cancels the second on the bottom. You end up with so many joules. So one photon of this red light at 700 nanometers has an energy 2.84 times 10 to the minus 19th joules per photon. That's a super small amount of light. All right, we were looking uh, in the last chapter, Hess's law, or delta H products minus delta H reaction. Reactants. Uh, reactions were in the kilojoules. So this is a pretty small number, okay? This is the energy per photon of light. But we want to know the energy for one mole of photons.
So let's take that number, the joules per photon, and turn it into joules per mole. And just like we did when we turned uh, atoms into moles, we used Avogadro's number. Here we're going to use Avogadro's number, but as 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd photons per mole. Again, Avogadro's number is just like a dozen. You can use it in anything you want. We've used it in atoms per mole, molecules per mole. Now we're using it in photons per mole. Oh my goodness. But anyway, joules per photon times photons per mole, the photons pH will cancel. You initially have joules per mole, that 171,000 number. A lot of times people will convert it into kilojoules, 1,000 joules per kilojoules, 171 kilojoules per mole. And this energy is actually the same magnitude as a lot of the delta H products minus delta H reactants uh, problems we did in problems problem set number five. And what that means is that red light at 700 nanometers is capable of breaking bonds. You can enact chemical change by doing nothing more than putting red light on it. And this is a cool kind of chemistry called photochemistry. You set your reactants up, you basically turn the light on, you go away for the weekend and <clears throat> study in the library all weekend, <clears throat> not. Anyway, you come back on Monday, whatever, and you've got your chemical made. If you can calibrate the energy of your light to the energy of the reaction, products minus reactants kind of thing, you can do this. Photochemistry, I think, would be such a cool field to be into. The next player in all of this, the people were just blown away by Einstein's wave particle duality and Planck's uh, quanta they were kind of blown away by. Well, then out of left field, more or less, came this guy named Niels Bohr. And Bohr is another one of the powerhouses of this section. And uh, he came into this uh, because he was looking, trying to build a simple model of the of the atom. And he came about it because he was, a, he was the first person to figure out possibly where sharp line spectra came from. And we're going to talk about what sharp line spectra are here in just a little bit. But needless to say, nobody had any idea where these sharp line spectra were coming from. And Bohr came along and came up with an idea that worked amazingly well, all things considered. He kind of pulled it out of left field, so it was a little bit different. But still, he did something that was really neat. He brought this field around. So let's talk about what sharp line line spectra are, and then we can talk about what Bohr figured out. So this is light. This is like visible light. All right, it's coming in. And if you've ever sent it through a prism, or if you've seen uh, that Pink Floyd album, <laughs> anyway, just Dark Side of the Moon. Anyway, if you've ever seen uh, light going through a prism, it makes a spectrum of colors. All right, so white light is actually all colors, basically. And the prism is able to separate it through refraction. And uh, the blue light uh, is usually, of course, as we talked about earlier, the shorter wavelengths. And the red light Light is usually the longer wavelengths, all right? And the refraction angle depends on the wavelength, and short wavelengths bend the most, so that's why blue is like way down here, all right? And the red actually doesn't bend very much, so that's what it is. But the important part here is that all white light really is a combination of colors, and you can separate them out with a prism, which is kind of cool. Let's try and figure out here which of the following forms of light will refract the least. All right. Now we've got red light, blue light, and black light. Now black light is not really appropriate here. Black light is a type of ultraviolet light that used to be really famous in the 70s. And if you're in a dark room with a black light, it makes your white things glow. Kind of, It's a cool kind of psychedelic effect, but it's not really appropriate here. Now, uh, short wavelengths will bend the most. All right. So we want to know what the shortest wavelength is. And you can see down down there that blue is shorter than red, which is long. So this one's going to be red. It refracts the least, all right, relative to blue. Blue would do the most, red would do the least. And again, black light doesn't count here. So cool. If we pour methanol onto sodium chloride and ignite it, the flame produced is yellow in color. 
If instead of using sodium chloride, we use boric acid, a compound made of boron, hydrogen, and oxygen, the flame produced is green in color. Each salt imparts a characteristic color. The emission of light by heated or burning objects provide important clues to our understanding of atoms. Most of the time, you don't have pure white light, like you don't have all the colors. And a lot of the elements, if you put them and you, uh, like they did in the video there, you can take like a salt of the element and put some methanol on it, which is just a way to get the flame going. And you'll see the different colors. Um, so you can see down here in the lower right, like KCL and uh, lead are kind of a darker kind of color. On the other hand, green can be boron. Uh, the red color can be things like strontium and stuff like that. All the elements have like a type of a color associated with them. And this process is exploited when it comes to neon lights. Neon lights, uh, when they're excited, can have different colors to them. And the light bulbs themselves are usually um, filtered with some kind of a piece through it. The neon light itself has a certain color and then they can put filters on it and stuff to see what happens. So this is kind of cool. If you have a pure element and you excite the atoms, you can actually get a specific color. You don't see white light because you don't have all the pieces. And again, this is the idea behind fireworks and all that kind of stuff. If a high voltage is applied to an element in the gas phase, the element emits light. Using a prism, we can split the light into its component colors. Every element emits a distinct set of colors unique to that element. People were really fascinated by the fact that some types of salts gave off certain colors and they wanted to see what happens. So what they did is they created essentially like a type of a light bulb. And in the light bulb, they had just that type of atom. They'd add some electricity to it. It excited the atoms and then they placed it through a prism. And this is an example of hydrogen, what happens with hydrogen. Now the hydrogen bulb is kind of a red purple color kind of thing. And it it looks pretty neat unto itself, but uh, it's a lot different than the light bulbs we use in our house usually, which are kind of a white color and stuff. All right, but it's all right. Anyway, they took that red purplish kind of hydrogen light bulb, placed it through a prism, and lo and behold, they saw that there were four distinct sharp lines that came out of it. And you can see in that little picture, it's kind of like there were two kind of blue purple, one kind of uh, in between, and then there was also a red one on the far side. Um, the 397 nanometer is harder to see, but if you did see that, it would look kind of indigo or purple or whatever. But anyway, sharp line spectra are what you see when you take one of these light bulbs with the element in it and you place it through a prism. And these are super, super sharp lines, all right? So they're only one thing coming out. And they can measure the wavelengths of these things pretty accurately. So you can see the different values there for hydrogen. We're going to talk about hydrogen a lot in the next section here, so we'll see these numbers come up. Notice how they're nanometers, all right? So nanometers are usually visible lines, and it does depend on the element. So hydrogen is different than helium. Helium is different than lithium. Lithium is different from uranium, et cetera, et cetera. Here's a picture that shows, I think, a better representation of hydrogen. Again, the light bulb kind of thing is there on the left. They send it through what's called a double slit experiment, and that's just to give you a plane of light. You don't want to have other light sources come in, stuff like that. And then you place it through the prism, and instead of seeing that kind of reddish, purplish color of the light bulb, you see there the other lines, a red and a green and two purplish kind of lines or two uh, blue, depending depending on your video. Um, and again, every element has this. So this can actually be used as a fingerprint to identify different elements. And that's really cool unto itself. The wavelengths are known to very high detail. And uh, we're going to talk about these four right here. This one right here is harder to visibly see. If you have very sensitive eyes, then it's easier. But the four there that I kind of underlined are ones we're going to talk about a lot. Um, and they're really cool. And again, those are used a lot of times to identify hydrogen. So if you had a mixture of gases, but you saw a line at 656.3 nanometers, probably 
then that line is going to be from hydrogen. As before though, remember that wavelengths and frequencies and stuff like that have a relationship to energy. So you can see how the wavelengths are getting bigger as you go left to right. So longer wavelengths will have smaller frequencies and lower energies. On the other hand, if you go right to left, you can see that the energies are getting bigger because wavelengths are getting smaller, but the frequencies would be getting larger as well. Um, Balmer was the first one to observe and measure those visible lines of hydrogen. So the Balmer series of hydrogen are basically the four lines starting at 410 and going over to 656.3 nanometers. Again, we'll talk about the 397 in a little bit too. Again, every element has its own fingerprint. So the top one up here on the left is hydrogen. Here's mercury. Notice how mercury has quite a few more lines than hydrogen, but again, you can measure each one of those thin lines and stuff, those sharp line spectra pretty readily. Neon actually has more lines even than mercury, which is kind of cool. Now again, the hydrogen bulb looks kind of purplish, and here's hydrogen in this example. Um, here's a helium bulb, and neon's right there. And again, you can see the different wavelengths and stuff. We'll talk about what this means emission spectrum here in a little bit. These are all emission spectrum, which is different than an absorbance spectrum. In astronomy, this is critical because when you have a star, say many, many light years away, there's no way that you can go next to it, take a sample, come back to your lab and measure what's inside it. That's not going to happen. So what people do is they take these spectrographs, which is basically measuring the spectrum, and they see some very complicated kind of procedures. But if you dig through that enough, you can then figure out, hey, there's hydrogen and hey, there's mercury or whatever. So they can actually tell the composition of stars and exoplanets, stuff like that, through these spectrographs. Making it more difficult for astronomers, though, is something called the Doppler effect. And I, this is something in physics you'll talk about more. Doppler effect makes the wavelength shift. Um, if you've ever been at a train station and a train goes by fast, it goes, Nyeh! all right, sound effects not necessary, sorry, but it, the train is only giving out like one sound, but the sound seems to change as it moves by you. The this is the Doppler effect. And there are red and blue shifts, so you can see the little lines down there on the spectrum. They're moving back to the left and the right as the objects move around. So it's pretty crazy. But again, astronomers are able to tackle all this and figure out how this works. And again, my hat's off to them. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Astronomy is awesome, but the electric pickle, I would argue, is even cooler. <laughs> so remembering that if you excite an atom with electricity, like the light bulbs we saw earlier, you'll begin to see light from it. And if you take a pickle, of all things, and you basically shove electricity through it, that's a very act that the person is controlling, and it's connected to basically a series of wires, you can actually see the sodium ions in the pickle light up, and it makes that kind of glowing thing. And I have seen this with my own eyes. A student a few years ago um, was really fascinated by this. So he brought in pickles. He made this work. He actually had some pickles uh, that were soaking in some potassium ions, like fake salt potassium. And it made kind of a purple thing. But anyway, um, after a while, the pickles begin to smell. So I warn you in advance. But anyway, it is pretty cool. Now, in the electric pickle, it's the sodium ions, which are exciting. If you've ever seen a fire, like at a campfire, the campfire is usually usually yellow. The yellow is a color very indicative of sodium ions. And so that glow, that yellow glow you see is from the sodium ions and the pickles used as preservatives and stuff like that. So it's pretty cool. But like I said, my student replaced the sodium chloride with a potassium chloride 
basically fake salt, let it soak for a while, and you can actually change that color. So my student with the potassium chloride, he made kind of a purple glow in the pickle, and that was pretty neat. Let's say that you have a barium, and barium, if you excite it, makes kind of a green flame. So what color would you think you'd see in an electric pickle soaked in barium chloride? Well, again, it has nothing to do with the pickle. It's about what it's soaked in. So the sodium was yellow, potassium was red, you can probably imagine that barium then would give a green flame. And I've heard of this being done. I haven't actually done it before, but I think it would be cool. I've never seen a pure black flame, but I do, uh, of course, like Lord of the Rings a lot. So probably it's something I've seen before. But anyway, in real world science, probably not going to happen kind of cool. So all of these, again, besides just being darky cool, are example of these sharp line spectra and how they bring out colors from certain elements. In the earliest 20th century, all right, they thought that electrons maybe were traveling around the nucleus in an orbit, all right, kind of like planets around the sun. Now, in this little picture, the red dots are electrons, the little purple dot and the plus in the middle, that's the nucleus. If this was correct, then any orbit should be possible. So it depending on the energy. So if you wanted to have the electron super close to the atom, that should be possible. If you wanted to have the electron way out here, that should be possible. As long as the energy wasn't a problem, you should be good to go, all right? But interestingly enough, electrons moving around positive protons create a little bit of electric energy, all right? And that electric energy is kind of like friction. And if you let the electron go around and around and around and around enough, it's going to create quite a, quite a charge. And eventually it's going to have to emit that energy out as like a burst, all right? Maybe a burst of energy who knows what it's going to be. But you can't have a negative electrons circling positive protons and not expect to have some energy problems. So if the atom was going to do this, according to classical physics, at the end, the atom would just explode or implode or it would break down, whatever you want to have it. And that's bad for us because electrons, or excuse me, atoms are in our bodies, all right? And fortunately, most of the time, our bodies are okay. The atoms don't start breaking down all of a sudden. So what this means here is that classical physics really didn't understand how the atom was put together, all right? Classical physics physics really didn't have the answers to how electrons can stay in stable quote-unquote orbits around the nucleus. So Bohr came in and said, well, throw classical physics right out the window. It's wrong. And he said, we need a new theory. And he said, let's use a quantum or wave mechanics. So arguably Bohr was one of the first ones to use the idea of quantum mechanics, which was kind of interesting. He based it, by the way, on Einstein's ideas, apparently, of the wave-particle duality, and this was, he just applied it to atoms. Now, Bohr assumed that electrons can only exist in certain orbits around the nucleus, and he called them stationary states. So I'm going to draw a little atom here in the upper left-hand corner. In the middle is the nucleus, and this right here is the electron. And let's say that that's an allowed state, and maybe this one is an allowed state. But if you wanted to have an electron in this dotted one right here, no, 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 said Bohr. You can only have certain stationary states where electrons can be. It can be in the closer one or the farther one, but it can't be in the middle, it can't be closer to the nucleus, maybe it can't be out there. This was very revolutionary because no one had thought, well, there would only be certain orbits that are possible. And it kind of makes doesn't make any sense at first because, yeah, electrons, as long as it's not a problem with energy, should be anywhere from the nucleus, but that's not what people see now. Electrons are restricted to quantized energy states. Here's that quanta term again. Quantized energy states are just the allowed energies possible between the nucleus and the electrons. And you can't get in between the quantized energy states. You have to be right on top of them for this to work. He was able to calculate, which was really cool, that the energy of these quantized states equals minus RHC over N squared. Now, H is Planck's constant. We saw that already. C is the speed of light. We saw that. 
R is what they call the Ryberg constant. It's this number right here. We're going to talk about the Ryberg constant, but it's not a number that you have to have at the ready. We're not going to use it that much. But most importantly for us, N is just a whole number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. Never zero, never a fraction. N is called the quantum number. And these are the quanta states that the electron can be in. So you could have an electron at N equals 1. You could have an electron at N equals 2, but you couldn't have an, an electron at n of 1.5. You have to have a whole number, and he called them quantum numbers, and that's going to follow us into the next discussion. So this is pretty cool. All right, here's the Ryberg constant. You don't have to know that. We're going to use it a little bit, but you don't have to know it. There's Planck's constant and the speed of light, and those numbers we will use a lot, and I do encourage you to know those. But also then, here's this quantum number, 1, 2, 3, 4, and that's really interesting. Now, in current quantum mechanic theory, which has gone way beyond Bohr, these things are still there. All right, it's a little bit different variation of them, but Bohr was actually ahead of his time. He actually got onto something uh, kind of accidentally, to be honest, which uh, was pretty important. So Bohr's model does have application even up to this day, which is really neat. But the thing is, he just kind of pulled this stuff out of thin air and nobody understood where it comes from. But it had some really cool results. And those sharp line spectra for hydrogen, the four lines, and the helium, and the fingerprints that astronomers use, he was able to explain atomic spectra for the first time. And no one had been able to do that up until Bohr. Here's an example of what I mean, uh, what, what Bohr's model was all about. Now, in the Bohr model, all right, there was the nucleus. That's the big positive. And then there was this one, two, three, four. And if you remember from the previous equation, or down here at the bottom, there's a 1 over n squared dependence. And mathematically what that means is that the gap from n to 1 to 2, pretty big, but then the gap from 2 to 3 is a bit smaller, and 3 to 4 is even smaller than 2 to 3, and 4 to 5 would be smaller yet, etc., etc., etc. So what Bohr postulated here is that electrons would start at the ground state. He called that n equals one. And initially they would absorb some energy and they would go to a higher state. Let's say n equals two. That's an endothermic process. They have to absorb energy to make that happen. But after a while, the electrons would get tired. They get homesick, if you will. And they would go from a higher end state down to a lower end state. That process is exothermic. Energy would be given off as you get closer to the nucleus. So the sharp line spectra came about because electrons initially were shot up to a higher end value. And then after a while, they would come back down from the higher end to the lower end. This is an energy axis, this y-axis right here. And you can calculate, like we're going to do here in a little bit, the energy going from 2 to 1. And that energy can be related back to wavelength, E equals HC over lambda. Oh, it's all coming together. But anyway, Bohr was the first person to figure this out. According to the Bohr model, when a hydrogen atom receives energy, its electron leaps from a low energy orbit to a higher one, forming an excited state. As the atom loses energy, the electron jumps back to a lower energy orbit, releasing light as it goes. When gaining energy, the orbit to which the electron jumps depends on the amount of energy involved. When the electron occupies the lowest energy orbit possible, the atom is said to be in the ground state. So in that little animation, you saw the electron at n equals 1 being excited. All right, maybe it was heated up. Who knows? Gamma rays from another star exploding. I don't know. Whatever. Something. It absorbed some energy. It went from a lower end to a higher end. That's going to be endothermic. It takes energy to have that happen. However, after a while, it says, man, I want to go back home. So it goes from the higher end to the lower end. That's going to be an exothermic, an exothermic transition. Energy is given off and those energies being given off are where the sharp line spectra comes from. And again, Bohr was the first person to figure that out and it's pretty cool.
Let's calculate the change in energy, delta E, for a mole of electrons, quote unquote, falling from a higher n, n equals 2, down to a lower n, n equals 1, all right? And it's a mole of electrons, too. Now, I'm going to use the symbol capital L for Avogadro's number, which is what happens so sometimes. Now, delta E, like the delta temperature we saw in the last section, final minus initial. So at the end, the electron's going to be at n equals 1, and initially the electron's going to be at n equals 2. Now minus R, H, C, L, those are all constants, and they're, they're the same for both final and initial. So if you pull those out, you have 1 over the n final squared minus 1 over the n initial squared. All right, so the final state is 1. The initial Initial, the initial state was 2, 2 squared. It's like 1 minus 1 fourth or 3 fourths. So if you take negative 3 fourths times RHCl, and I encourage you to do this yourself. Go ahead and do it in your calculator right now. Here's R, that's the weird one. H, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. Uh, C, speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth. Avogadro, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And I threw in here another one too. I also threw joules to kilojoules. There's a thousand joules and a kilojoules. But if you've done this right, negative 984 kilojoules. And that is an exothermic transition. That means that energy is given off going from n equals 2 to n equals 1. Pretty cool. What is the frequency and wavelength of the photons emitted by the 2 to 1 transition? And again, we saw in the last slide that the delta E is 984. But before we go there, I want to talk about the upper picture. To get the electron to the n equals 2, it had to absorb energy to go from the n equals 1 to n equals 2. We saw that it's negative 984 kilojoules to go to 2 to 1. That's exothermic. And like a lot of things in thermodynamics, the opposite process, i.e. going from 1 to 2, is going to be equal but opposite in sign. So it's going to take positive 984 kilojoules to go from 1 to 2. Going from 1 to 2 is called absorption, and absorption spectroscopy is a big part of science. Um, in biology and chemistry, we use SPEC21s and things like that. They are absorbent spectrometers. They measure the energy absorbed, and that's a really cool feature. And a lot of times in programs like CSI, they will use absorbance to figure out that, oh, there's the blood and stuff, but that's neither here nor there. In this section, we're mostly talking talking about the exothermic version of that endothermic process. So absorbance is endothermic. Emission spectrum, which is what we're talking about, are exothermic. Energy is given off. So it's from higher end to lower end. Absorbance is lower end to higher end. Emission spectrum, which is what we're talking about now, and that's what the sharp line spectra are, higher end to lower end. So anyway, back to your regular scheduled programming. The energy was negative 984 kilojoules per mole, let's figure out the frequency and wavelength of the photons. Now what we have to do is we have to get it down to joules per photon in order to go to wavelength and frequency. So we're going to turn kilojoules to joules, we're going to use Avogadro's to go from joules per mole to joules per photon, and then finally we'll use E equals h nu or E equals hc over lambda to figure out the frequency and the wavelength. This first part here, we're basically turning quickly the energy into frequency. Uh, I turned the kilojoules per mole into joules per mole by multiplying by 10 to the third. This is the energy. I'm dividing it by Planck's constant and Avogadro's number. And if you do that, you will get directly the frequency, all right? Now frequency, like we talked about earlier, is usually waves per second. And technically, on this 
one, you're going to get a negative wave frequency. All right. And you can have frequency going positive one direction, negative in the other. But the convention is to always have positive frequencies and positive wavelengths whenever possible. So if you reported negative 2.47 times 10 to the 15th, it would be okay. But the convention is to always use positive frequencies and positive wavelengths unless you're doing it other ones. But anyway, 2.47 times 10 to the 15th is the frequency of this particular transition. And if you want to figure out wavelength, wavelength equals speed of light divided by frequency. I turned the meters answer into nanometers and it came out to be 122 nanometers. And this 122 nanometers was almost exactly in agreement with the experiment from the sharp line spectra. Bohr nailed it. And that was a true feat to his skill that he was able to do that. 122 nanometers is in the ultraviolet spectrum. It's not one of the lights, the lines that I showed you earlier, but it is one of the transitions and that's really cool. At the bottom there, I've got the note again, absorbance is endothermic and emission is exothermic, but they are equal but opposite in sign from each other. Which diagram, A or B, represents an emission line? And the answers are, of course, A, B, both diagrams or neither diagram. Now, emission is always an exothermic emission line. All right, it's an exothermic process. And the y-axis on both of these graphs is energy, all right? So if you have an exothermic process, the beginning state has to be higher energy than the lower state or you can think about the electron as falling down, quote, quote unquote, closer to the nucleus. The nucleus would be kind of like down here right now. So on B, you're getting away from the nucleus. You're going to have to add energy to get away from it. On the other hand, in A, the electron's getting closer to it. That's going to be um, giving off some energy. So definitely A is the emission line, all right? You go from a higher end to a lower end. And on A, you're going from 4 to 2. So you're getting closer to the nucleus. Again, B would be an absorbance line. You're going from one to four, from a lower end to a higher end, and that's just going to take some energy. Absorbance and emission are both used a lot and stuff, all right? And there are ways to do all of these kind of things. Um, the sample will absorb some wavelengths of light, causing dark lines in the spectra, and that's where a lot of these absorbance things will come from. So you can see down here in the bottom, here are some absorbance spectrums for different pieces. Um, on the left-hand side, here's the absorbance spectrum for hydrogen. And you can see there's kind of like one, two, three, and arguably four lines, four black lines. Those are the four hydrogen lines, but they're being absorbed. They're not emitted, which is what we saw earlier. So absorbance is a very cool technique, and there's lots of cool things you can do. You'll learn more about absorbance spectra probably in organic chemistry more so than here, but it's got a lot of neat uses, and they're both really cool. Emission is fun because, you know, the light bulbs overhead right now are emission, basically emission sources. Anytime you have light, a flashlight, whatever, it's an emission spectrum. That's what's causing the light. So it's kind of fun to talk about emission, but it also makes sense in terms of sharp line spectra, blah, blah, blah. Here are the different lines for hydrogen. Now, here's the N value on the left, one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera, and they go up to eight, all right? And all of the transitions that end at N equals one, all right, we don't see with our eyes. Those are actually more like ultraviolet lines, all right? And they're very, very hard to see. But the important part for us here is that all the lines that end at n equals 1 started with a higher transition. So these numbers right here are like the minus RHC numbers on the left hand sides and you can use the difference between those to find the energies. Lyman was the first person to look at those lines and they were the ultraviolet lines and those are cool. Passion on the far right looked at the infrared lines and that's cool. But Balmer's lines, which we talked about earlier, all the Balmer lines start at higher end 
and end up at n equals 2. And this is where those four lines come from that I talked about earlier. All right, the smaller transition, the 3 to 2 transition has a small, um, has, a, has a relative, excuse me, has a relatively large wavelength, but a small frequency. All right, so that's why it's red. On the other hand, the 6 to 2 transition has a relatively short wavelength, but more energy associated with it. So you're seeing all the kind of things right now. Um, so the Balmer series for hydrogen, they all end at an N low, if you will, of two. They start at higher N and go down to lower N. Sometimes people think about this as a type of a ladder, all right? And under the ladder is the nucleus. I'll just put a positive down there. This would be like one, two, three, four. All of the Balmer lines stop at the second step, all right? None of them go down to the first step. The problem with the ladder, though, is that as we saw, there's this one over N squared dependence. So really, N equals one to N equals two is the bigger gap. N equals three is closer. N equals four, N equals five. So the steps get closer as you go up. That's why the ladder isn't the perfect idea, but sometimes it's cool to visualize it. And most importantly is that Bohr nailed these numbers with his theory. Nobody knew where they came from at first, but he figured it out. Very, very cool. So Bohr's theory was fantastic. It rocked science, literally. He got a Nobel Prize. He was really, really cool. Everybody patted him on the back because nobody was able to figure out where those sharp line spec were coming from. And he said, aha, I have from the electrons. However, like with anything, there were some problems. Bohr's theory worked perfectly for hydrogen and helium plus one, single electron systems, all right? But once you start having helium with two electrons or carbon with six electrons, his theory didn't work out too well. Also, he introduced the idea of quantum uh, levels kind of artificially. He said, this is how it's going to work, but he didn't really know why. So Bohr definitely was a step in the right direction, but he wasn't right. He wasn't perfectly right. Now, it is important to remember though, that hydrogen and helium plus one work just as well today as they did back in Bohr's time. He really did a good job. And he started people thinking about this. And I think that was what was really important about Bohr. So Bohr is a hero of mine, definitely. But anyway, the next step then people started talking about figuring out was to actually develop quantum mechanics or what it's sometimes called as wave mechanics.